Um, I'd just like to uh, welcome Dr. Kenneth Montgomery to our podcast, along with my host, Rob Shapiro, and our executive producer, Donna Gill. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, Dr. Montgomery comes to us by way of uh, the Nichols Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma, of course. Um, it seems to be a common theme, theme early on in, with these podcasts. But he's now at uh, Tri-County Orthopedics. And uh, he has done a hand fellowship. He's done our sports medicine fellowship. He graduated from the University of California, uh, San Francisco School of Medicine. He did his residency at a hospital for special surgery. And, um, and he's published a, a wealth of literature and books and uh, now, now serves as uh, the chairman of the medical department and the, and the head team physician for the New York Jets. And... Um, it's a really a big honor to have Dr. Montgomery with us tonight. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Tim and Rob, for inviting me to come be part of this program. Yes, um, as some of you might have heard earlier, um, we were we were we were privileged enough to have Dr. Montgomery speak um, at uh, at our residence uh, a residence gathering where he presented on uh, on graph choices for the ACL. So I said, why don't we do this for a podcast? Um, before we get started with that, tell us about your, tell us about your travel to the, to India and what you're doing with underprivileged communities in India and Vietnam and how you got a employee of um, a professional physical therapist, Mike, Mike Haverstadt involved. I found that really super interesting and rewarding. Could you tell the audience about that talk? Yeah, absolutely. We have a uh, program that uh, Teo Mendez, who's um, part of the uh, New York Orthopedics Group, Teo and I started a program in 2015 called OrthoNations. And essentially, our program is working with surgeons, physical therapists, nurses, and upcoming anesthesiologists um, at uh, in developing countries. Uh, and so, what we've done over the years uh, is we've gone over and we do work with the surgeons over there. We'll work with them in the operating room, both in Vietnam and uh, Nepal is actually where we're going in, in November. Uh, and then about two years ago, we started doing this more with physical therapy as well. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting that when we were in Vietnam last year, uh, we gave sort of a combined lecture. Haverstadt gave uh, some lectures and then I gave lectures as well. And all the questions that happened at the end were related to physical therapy. So the, the surgeon, who's the one that put on the whole program, he every once in a while would say, well, I'm going to ask Ken a question because I feel like I should. But mm -hmm. all of the questions came out were literally rehab-related questions. And of course, um, any orthopedic surgeon who has half a brain knows that they don't really know anything about physical therapy. So I, I immediately that. deferred all of those uh, questions over to Mike, and he did an amazing job. So we're actually going back to Nepal. Uh, it'll be Mike's first trip to Nepal, my second in November, and uh, it's something that we do a few times a year. And we, what we do with our program is we find surgeons and therapists from those countries, and we bring them to the United States where we really teach them here in country, so they see what our program's like and how we uh, do things. And that allows them when they go back to really try to emulate some of the things that they can uh, in their countries, even though you can imagine what we have here and our resources um, make it difficult for them to approach that in their countries, but at least it's a start. So when they're harvesting your graft over there, can they, can they have a choice like we're talking about tonight between a bone tendon bone and a quad tendon and a hamstring tendon, or even do they have access to allografts? Well, it's a great question. They don't have access to allografts. So there are no allografts in Vietnam and there's none in Nepal. So uh, it's, it's both cultural, um, that people don't donate their bodies to science and therefore you don't get grafts that way. Uh, and so because of that over the years, they just never have developed graft banks. They, they are starting to develop them, particularly for uh, life-saving things like kidney transplants, liver transplants, uh, and heart transplant. So those things are being done in small, small subsections of those countries for the elite. Uh, but there's nothing uh, like ligament and orthopedic tissue available. 
Uh, they do have the ability to take uh, all the other autographs uh, that they want. So they could take quad tendon. We did actually the first quad tendon graft in Vietnam when we were over there last um, summer. Uh, so that was kind of fun. We had the fellows were here. We taught them how to do them here in the United States. And then when we went back over there, we did the first few over there. So that was a fun thing to do. Uh, patella tendon is done, but it's done very rarely there for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the oscillating saws we use to cut the patella tendon uh, and the bone are expensive and they don't really have those. Uh, hamstrings are by far the most popular graft in both uh, in, in most of Asia, I would say. Uh, and in much, of, in much of the Eastern world, the hamstring graft is far, by far the most popular. Mm, interesting. Um, we'll talk about the hamstring graft in a little bit, but first let's take, let's take the audience through a little bit of graft choice history and how one of the first grafts was the fascia lati, and then that was back in the 1900s, and then it went to the iliotibial band, and then they were actually doing quad tendons uh, in the 1930s. Is that, is that correct, doctor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, you know, there were very few people that were getting any kind of a ligament reconstruction back in those mm -hmm. times. I think that while the ACL was described, they really didn't know the function, just like even in my training, they were, there were still surgeons taking out the meniscus because they thought it was like um, your appendix. And so if you're in there, just take it out. Um, they knew that the ACL was an important structure, but they didn't understand the complexity. So yeah, while original ACL reconstructions were being done in the late 30s, they didn't really start to become more common until the 60s when sort of all the the godfathers of sports medicine started to come in, right? The James Nicholas's and, you know, the Adonis and the Marshalls. Um, yeah, right. So they started to really um, talk about the importance of it, uh, particularly as it related to, um, to athletes, but also to people who just had significant traumatic injuries. So uh, that's when those graphs started to, to come into favor. And when you got to the hospital for special surgery, were they doing... Were they doing hamstring tendons, patella tendons, quad tendons, uh, bone tendon bone? Um, I, I remember having done a couple uh, clinical rotations there. They were playing with the Dacron ligament when I was there. Did that? Those were the choices uh, in the in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that the the big transition sort of went from hamstrings. It used to be just a two strand hamstring graft. That was uh, one of the original ones that gained that popularity. Uh, and then once the interference screws came into play in the late eighties, uh, that's when uh, patella tendon grafts became uh, the prominent graft. So, so it's interesting, you know, depending on where you train you get a very different viewpoint of what kind of graft is the standard of care. Uh, we talk about the patella tendon being the standard of care, but you know, like I said, in Asia, in Europe, in, in England, by far and away the standard of care is the hamstring. Uh, we like the uh, patella tendon because it's got bone on both ends of it, and therefore you get this bone to bone fixation, uh, which, which compared to some of the early hamstrings was a clear improvement. So. The early hamstrings were a two-strand graft suspended on both sides, uh, so it was very long graft fixation length from the femur down to the tibia, uh, and there was no compression in the joint, and so with this two-strand graft just kind of windshield wiped back and forth. So no surprise, you look at those, and those those grafts became pretty loose um, and had pretty high failure rates. The patella tendon came in, it's a short graft because it's the patella tendon, it's got bone on both sides, and then it was fixed at the aperture with bone. Uh, and so it clearly had uh, far improved outcomes as it was compared to the early hamstrings. So um, in New York, I would say still by far and away, the most popular graft uh, has been the patella tendon, uh, even though the ham, or not the hamstrings, but the the quad tendon, I think, is uh, gaining significant popularity. We we work with the same fellows every year, the same fellowship I did back with you, Tim, in 1995, 96. Um, I'm still, I'm one of the teachers of that fellowship now. So we have four fellows every year. And so I get to sample them what they've seen in their different trainings, uh, what they're doing in the city uh, at Lenox Hill and what they do with us. Uh, and so 
So while still I think that the majority of the graphs being done in New York City are patella tendon, uh, there's a, a creeping up number of the quad tendons uh, being done all the time. Do, are, is anybody using the endo button anymore where you, where you would uh, fixate the graft with suture and then pass the suture back outside the femur, put an endo button in there and use that kind of fixation? Is that kind of way? Yeah, repeat the question, Tim, because you, you sort Sorry. of froze a second. Is anybody using an endo button anymore? Uh, so endo buttons get used as that suspensory fixation quite a bit. So endo button is just one version of suspensory fixation. Okay. Uh, and so so every company from Arthrex to Smith & Nephew to Stryker, uh, they all have a endo button version, which is just a suspension that, that brings it up. Um, and so that was one of the original ones being done with the hamstrings. And I'm sure endo button is still out there. I'm not sure which company uh, but, makes it. Doctor, but Tiba went to soft tissue screws, right? Where they where they fixated the hamstring or now the quad tendon with a soft tissue uh, screw so it does not tear the graft. Is that is that what's going on or is it something different? Yeah, soft I mean, um, some people do. For example, I use... Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I use uh, I don't use soft tissue screws. I will use suspensory fixation on both sides. I will sometimes back up the tibial side, but the particularly with a quad tendon graft, the graft is so big uh, that to smash a screw in next to it uh, really is much more likely to damage uh, the graft. The the graft is fixed different with a quad tendon than it is with a hamstring because the the endo button or the fixation device is literally sutured to the end of the graft. And so uh, the old endo buttons was essentially just a, a loop and then the graft went around it. So right. theoretically that over time could rip through the graft. Um, but with the, the newer techniques, the graft is kind of being, number one, it's now uh, certainly with hamstrings, it's a four strand graft and not a two strand graft. And so you don't see those ripping through like you used to with the two strand graft. Uh, and then with the with the quad tendon graft, you're actually suturing a tape around the end of the graft and there's multiple sutures that go through. So it really captures it. And so it's not gonna rip through that at all. Excellent, good. Um, when choosing between a quad tendon graft and a bone tendon bone, can you go over some of the pros of the quad tendon, which is gaining in, uh, in popularity across our country, actually? Yeah. Well, I, I think the real, uh, to start out with, is just to sort of say why it's gained popularity. So, so the reason when you do a patella tendon graft, um, and yes, we can, we can say the patella tendon will start out with that as being the gold standard, at least at this point, I think, in the United States, it's what you should compare to when you're talking about your highest end athlete, right? So, you know, most of our people that we do ACL reconstructions on are weekend warriors. And so it probably doesn't matter what graft you use, everything's better than not having an ACL. And most grafts don't retear. Uh, when you look at hamstrings and quads, they have anywhere from a 90 to 95%, you know, success rate for getting, for not uh, retearing again. Um, the patella tendon graft, because it takes a bone plug on both sides, it cuts into the bone and it's pretty invasive on that extensor mechanism. So it's always been known, and that's why the hamstrings have a lot of popularity in other parts of the world. There's less anterior knee pain, there's less quad inhibition. Um, it's just, if, if I used to do both of those operations pretty frequently, if you look at a patient who had a BTB versus a hamstring, the hamstring is always a much easier recovery for them. And so, so that's the reason that we're always kind of looking for something that would be sort of BTV-like and yet less invasive. So the quad tendon is a longer graft. It just your quad tendon is a lot longer than your patella tendon, which is fixed at both ends by its distance. The quad tendon, you can go much higher into the thigh. It's also a much thicker graft. So for many people, uh, in fact, most people, when they take the quad tendon, they don't cut into the patella at all. So I'll only cut into the patella tendon or to the patella at the top. And there are some people who do that because they want the bone to bone fixation on one side. And then they do, 
you know, soft tissue fixation on the other side, but most people just do soft tissue on both sides. Um, and so it's much less invasive on the knee. It doesn't have that risk of um, patella fracture because you're not cutting into the patella. Uh, and really for me, it's much more, the recovery of it in the first several weeks is much more like a hamstring ACL than a BTV ACL. Uh, and so I used to do uh, hamstrings for all of my sort of weekend warriors that were say younger than 36, 37. You know, if you were anywhere from 22 to 35 and you were a weekend warrior, I would do hamstrings uh, because it was a lot easier than a BTB and probably just as good. Um, but now, because the, the, the quad tendon is so much similar as far as sort of the invasiveness on the knee and how the patient feels, I'm now doing many fewer hamstring autographs and many more um, quad tendon autographs. Okay. Um, are, are you, are you confident that the biomechanical properties of the bone tendon bone are similar to that of the quad tendon? Yeah, I, I think there have been a number of, I mean, with everything you do, you have to kind of take a little bit of a leap when you, uh, jump into it, sort of a leap of faith. My leap of faith was, uh, believe it or not. So there's a guy named Dave Gazanica, who's a team doctor for the chargers. We yeah. used to work together on Long Island. Um, and so. Uh, he, he and I went to local high schools uh, together in Southern California. He did the Stedman Hawkins Fellowship. And so when he came into practice on Long Island, he was the only guy around doing hamstrings because at the Stedman Hawkins Clinic, the skiers would get hamstrings instead of BTBs because Stedman was that. So he taught me how to do hamstrings many, many years ago. And that's when I became a firm believer in that as a graph. Um, again, my highest end athletes, I would use BTB, but for the rest of us, I would use hamstrings. Uh, and then years ago, maybe five or six years ago, we were at the combine and he told me that he hadn't done a BTB in eight years once he started doing quad tendons. Uh, and he told about the advantages of it. Uh, so at some point I started doing the research and looking into it. And when there was enough body of evidence that sort of suggested that the biomechanics and uh, the outcomes are as good with quad tendon, then I started to do it. And then I've seen the improvement that you see clinically in the early phases. Um, so back to your question with the biomechanics. Yeah, there have been a few studies that have looked at the biomechanics, the, the graph strength of the quad tendon. So if you, if you ever look at the lateral of the knee, the sagittal of the knee MRI, if you look at the quad tendon and then you look at the patella tendon, the patella tendon is probably half the thickness of the quad tendon. The quad mm -hmm. tendon is just longer and thicker. And so because of that, the, um, the strength of the quad tendon graft is about almost 100% stronger than that of the BTB. It's near 90% uh, stronger. And then the stiffness is also about 50% stronger. So biomechanically, the graft um, not only is as good as the BTB, but it's actually superior. Um, you know, the question would be, well, what happens if you don't have that bone to bone healing that you get with the patella tendon? And that's still the argument that people would have. And, and I guess I would say that if you just look at the outcomes of the studies comparing the two groups, uh, it may be that bone to bone healing is not important to have a great outcome. Yes. Uh, as long as you get tendon to bone healing. Absolutely. And I can refer the audience to the paper that you presented to us that Perez uh, et al. in AGSM in 2019 looked at the outcomes, uh, clinical outcomes of bone tendon bone compared to quad tendons, and there was no difference. There was no difference in I IKC IKDC9. There was no difference in strength. There was no difference in range of motion with these uh, with these athletes. Um, what about uh, what about um, quad weakness? Everybody's worried about quad weakness in these in these uh, in these quad uh, tendon ACL reconstructions. Are you worried about that? Are you worried about that at 50 years old when when males tend to tear their quad tendons I, uh, more frequently than females? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, any concerns? Yeah. So you're talking about quad tendon weakness, like tearing the tendon itself, right? Because 
because because we definitely get quad weakness with every ACL we do. Even the hamstrings get quad weakness, right? It's absolutely. One, it's one of the main markers we look at with our functional ACL tests that that we do to determine when someone's ready to go. We people with a you know a hamstring ACL that have fifty percent quad strength at six months who are not rehabbing well. Um, you definitely get quad weakness in the muscle in both um, in in all ACLs. And mostly with BTBs and mostly with quad tendon because uh, because it's an anterior graft harvest, so it has more of an impact. As far as the tendon itself, um, then yeah, I mean when you're cutting into the tendon, then you're definitely going to create some weakness there. Now almost everyone who takes the graft will do what we do with the BTB, which is that if you take the center of the graft out here, then we'll suture. The rest of the graft side to side. Mm -hmm. The truth is, the quad tendon is a lot wider than the patella tendon is, and the volume of it is a lot more. So the relative amount of tendon that you're taking, percentage-wise, is less on the quad tendon than it is at the patella tendon. Um, I mean, Jerry Rice, I think, you know, had an ACL reconstruction with a patella tendon, came back in five or six months, and then tore his patella tendon, you know. I think the second game back that he played. Um, now that said, I don't think I've ever personally seen a patient with a quad tendon or a patella tendon graft that we took that's ruptured that tendon in the future. Um, yeah, no, old, people, old, old people like me definitely <laughs> stumble and miss a step and go down. And I fixed two patella tendons and one quad tendon this week and just average old people who are, who are slipping and falling. Uh, the incidence of patella tendon, of quad tendon rupture uh, after an ACL has been described as 0.2%. So it's, you know, a quarter of 1% essentially. So it's pretty rare. I've never seen it, but, you know, they they say in, in medicine, if you haven't seen a specific complication, that probably means you haven't done enough of the operation yet. <laughs> that is true. What complications have you seen? What do we need to be on the lookout for as physical therapists? Is there, I mean, that, that's a big, that's a big graft you're putting in there. Do we have a higher incidence of uh, cyclops lesions? Do we have a, a harder time getting, getting knee extension full and hyperextension? Do you still ask your therapist, hey, rehab to the hyperextension of the opposite side like we used to in the old days, doc. What, what are the complications that you see and how should uh, we look at that? Yeah, I don't change my rehab, uh, you know, frankly, from one graft to the next. So if I'm doing hamstrings, if I'm doing BTB or quad tendon, I'm still using the same accelerated rehab, same thing that you guys are doing at Nisman all the time. And, and you know, I think we talked about it at the conference. You know, people ask, you know, how do you decide on, on your rehab? Well, virtually all orthopedic surgeons decide on that from who they sold the rehab program from when they were training. Uh, we don't know anything about rehab, so so we get it from someone else. We'll look for someone who's a respectable source, whether that's a NISMAT or uh, American Sports Medicine. We're looking for people that you know we believe put a lot of effort into making these decisions, and then we just take it and we put our own name on the top, uh, like we did it. Uh, but no, I want. I, I think one of the bigger complications uh, with any ACL is not getting full extension. Uh, and I think that if the patient has hyperextension, then if they have 20 degrees of hyperextension on one side and only five degrees on the surgical side, then they feel like that's not right. So in general, I personally will, you know, it all comes down to how you fix the graft and at what knee angle you fix the graft. So in the old days with hamstrings, which were traditionally looser when they were two strand grafts, they would fix the graft in 20 degrees of flexion, understanding that that it will then be tighter in full extension over time. But if you fix a four-strand ACL graft, uh, hamstring, or a quad tendon graft in 20 degrees of flexion, you may capture the graft and not be able to get full extension. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm always going to fix all of my grafts, whichever one it is, with the knee in full extension and even hyperextension. Listen, if somebody had 20 degrees of hyperextension, that kind of hyperlaxity is always going to be super concerning. But but even with 10 degrees, more typical, I'll fix it in 10 degrees of hyperextension. That way, at least you get that um, natural inclination of what you have on the opposite side. 
Um, and yeah, I want the therapist to be able to work on getting that full uh, extension. That's how people feel normal. Um, as far as Cyclops lesions and things, that's more, to me, that's more of a technical detail. I mean, you can get Cyclops lesions even when you do the operation perfectly, but the most common reason that we get Cyclops lesions, uh, there's two reasons. Number one is when we drill the tibial tunnel and that drill comes into the joint, it sort of throws this bone up into the joint. So there's soft tissue, uh, there's bone fragments that come up there and they're often still attached. You can then put your graft through that and all of that soft tissue can sit around the base of your graft. Some people actually like that because they think it improves the vascularity, just like some people don't get rid of the, the, um, the footprint. But mm -hmm. all that stuff that's left there uh, is sort of essentially ready to develop scar tissue and form a cyclops lesion. And then the other reason is more common is that you put your tibial tunnel too anterior. So instead of having it at an appropriate distance so that when the knee goes to full extension, you see the graft tuck completely into the notch. If your tibial tunnel is too anterior, then now when you go to full extension, you're essentially impinging on the anterior fibers. And it looks okay during the surgery, but what happens is you continue to focus on hyperextension is you rupture the anterior fibers of your graft and then those fibers roll up and they develop the scar tissue, which becomes a cyclops. So, so to me, I think in, in 25 years of doing this, I think I've had three patients who've developed cyclops lesions. Um, and I try to clean all those things out so that things are in the right place. So it's pretty uncommon, um, but I've definitely cleaned out a lot of cyclops lesions that have come from the outside and people who couldn't get extension. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, before we go into the research article tonight, uh, Rob Shapiro, do you have any questions? Or are there any questions in the in the queue from the audience? Sure, as we go on through the history, how about bear procedure? What is your thoughts? To, uh... Yeah, uh, I think it's a very interesting procedure. I have done it um, in the lab. I've yet to find the perfect patient to do it in the operating room, uh, and and. You know, it's one of these things that we, of course, we have all these uh, great well-meaning reps uh, who are trying to get us to try their new devices and their new implants. And of course, uh, if they ever rep something that uh, takes on a new life, then they're gonna make a lot of money with it. Um, the bear implant uh, was introduced and developed by a woman who, who did the research that created the implant. She's the person who's done the studies on it so far. Um, the recovery is not any shorter, so it's still a six to nine month uh, to one year recovery. Uh, and to me, if you have the option of going in and essentially what you're doing is you're kind of doing a primary repair and putting this collagen over the top of it, right? So the idea is that maybe for these very young people um, that it's going to be good. And, and, and in many ways, it's similar and analogous to the primary repair of the ACL, right? So, so we have a few doctors in the community who believe that primary repair the vast majority of times is uh, just as good as an ACL reconstruction. Um, but for me, we've got 30 years of data on ACL reconstructions that show a 90 to 95% return to sport rate. Uh, and so it's hard to beat that. So the bare implants, one of these things that if I take someone and I do that operation, which might be easier and it's no graft harvest. Um, so that's the only advantage of it, right? There's the only advantage is there's no graft harvest uh, because the rest, the rehab, the length of rehab, all of that is the same. So once I see some high intensity athletes that are playing lacrosse and football in college um, that have had bears that have had the same success rate, then I'll be jumping on board for it. Because I know that if I just take a new graft from somewhere else and I put it in there and let it heal there, that's got a pretty high success rate. Um, so, you know, things need to change to, to sort of change your mind. And, you know, when are you gonna put your own patient at risk? When are you gonna put your family member at that risk of having an inferior outcome because you're trying something new? Um, that, you know, people are advertising that they do it all the time. and I have a couple partners who've done it on a couple patients, and I think in the right people, it's probably fine. In the long run, it may be great. 
Uh, but for now, there's only a couple studies that are out there. And, and I love the title of one of them, which is that bare implant is not inferior to ACL reconstruction. So it didn't <laughs> say it was better. It just said that it wasn't inferior uh, in the first 100 patients that they looked at. And that was actually written by the person who owns half of the company and has mm -hmm. developed the implant. So once we start to see independent uh, professionals outside that have no financial benefit from from the success of it, sort of come in and show randomized trials, then then I'd be more interested in it. So, as, yeah, as one of, as one of our mentors said, James A. Nicholas, never be the first person or the last person to do new procedure. That's exactly right. And I just had this same conversation with someone who wants me to try an articular cartilage, you know, thing. He's a great guy. His company is a great company, and he's. He's got a new patch that's that's got coral on one side and uh, artificial bone on the other, and you can just sort of put it on there, and it's supposed to recreate what an OATS procedure would do. Uh, he's like, yeah, what, you know, why don't you do that? You have, you know, I do a lot of cartilage work. I do a lot of OATS, allograft, autograft. And I said to him, I said, well, because I know those procedures work. I said, and, and I'm just, you know, which patient do I do this procedure on and hope that they spend six months and that they're better. You know, I mean, we need some randomized trials to kind of show that it's it's good. I mean, I didn't jump on quad tendon when it first came on board. Um, same thing, the other, uh, the other version that we have is uh, all the collateral ligament reconstructions in the elbow, right? So yep. in the original days, um, all the collateral ligament primary repair described by Curl and Job had like a 60% success rate. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it fell out of favor once they described the Tommy John procedure, putting a new graft in instead of just repairing what's there. But now we actually have a technique where we use this internal brace that really protects the repair, and then you're repairing it in specific situations. And now that actually, to me, 90% of my ulnar collateral ligaments are repairs instead of reconstructions. And yet 10 years ago, there was virtually no repairs because of that old data. So, so I, listen, I will jump on board when I, when I feel like there's good unbiased people that are doing the research and demonstrating that in their opinion, it, it's as good or better, obviously. Thank you. Any I questions? see Jim Collins up there. Yay. Jim, how you doing? Pretty good, Dr. Montgomery. Good to see you. Thanks yeah, for your Jim's, time tonight. Sure. Jim's yeah. been to Vietnam with us a couple times with OrthoNation. So, oh, yeah? Sure. I, yeah, yeah. So I think it's amazing. You know, we obviously, we develop different kinds of relationships when we, you know, sit in hot and sweaty environments and uh, perspire all over each other. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But it, it's really fun to see, you know, people teach and be in that sort of group situation teaching lectures in front of uh, large audiences and then working with the therapists and working with the doctors uh, there. So I've had the privilege to do that with Jim a couple of times in Vietnam, so. Yeah, and, and likewise, I do have one quick question. I remember vaguely when I was there in 2018 and 2019, that in lieu of the bone tendon bone or the hamstring autograft, uh, in Vietnam, the doctors would use the per a peroneal uh, longus tendon. Mm. Did you see any of that yeah. when you went this year with Mike? I, I have, I have, uh, I have actually seen it before. So I didn't see it at all this year. Um, and this year, because two of the guys that had been with us, uh, they had finished the fellowship. So we actually, I was, we we're talking about, we actually did quad tendon grafts because when we got over there, they wanted to do those while I was there, so that when we were doing the first ones they had some backup, even though they had seen it here and done it in the lab. Uh, I've only seen the perineal tendon done once, and that was for a multi-ligament uh, reconstruction. So it was ACL, PCL, uh, and I think posterior lateral corner, and that was a few years back. Uh, so it's an interesting graph that, you know, I would have no idea. They make a little one-inch incision uh, around the ankle, they just reach in with a clamp, they pull out this gigantic tendon, and then they use a tendon stripper to take it out of the foot. I'm like, wow, that seems like that's an important tendon. Um, 
it's it's not even the most popular graph there by far because some people believe that it has some significant um, graph morbidity uh, in the ankle and foot, um, but uh, there's still some people who use it. And of course, I guess the farther away you get from academic institutions, the more people are just gonna use what they learned 10, 20 years ago. All right. So with that, let's go over the article to support uh, support the use of quad tendons or cell tendons. We'll see which one this article supports. We chose an article tonight that looks at outcomes of bone patella bone autographs versus quadricep tendons, and they did all they studied all female soccer players and they had an average follow up of about five years. Um, it was a very interesting article, and they they wanted to see uh, does the functional outcomes compare uh, between these two groups. When we look at the methods and the data and the data collected, um, certainly when you read this article, were, was the technique similar to the way that you uh, repair the ACL, uh, either bone tendon bone or, or quad tendons with femoral and tibial side interference screws or continuous adjustable loops to century fixation uh, with a posterior drawer of force. Is that how you also do it? Very similar or very different? Uh, yes, that's that's how I do it. I don't do a posterior drawer force with either of my ACLs. Um, I know some people do do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the suspensory fixation uh, and then the interference screw is absolutely how we uh, do it. And uh, we'll talk about the physical therapy at the end, but there's a standard pro physical therapy protocol initiated a week after the surgery that included modalities, quadriceps strengthening, range of motion, and a stepwise physical therapy protocol to return those people to sports. Um, I think that's pretty standard. We can talk about differences, if you will, and, uh, and things that I've seen with quad tendons that have really kind of uh, got Caught, got my attention, if I, if I would say. Um, what was good about this paper was that also they did a power analysis. Um, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of physical therapy journals doing power analysis, looking at a looking at a outcome and looking at a measurement technique, doing a power analysis and finding out exactly how many patients you need in each group to trust the significance of the of their findings. So I found that very uh, very advantageous. So this paper uh, looked at a total of 123 consecutive soccer players um, undergoing 53 undergoing quad tendons, 70 undergoing uh, patella tendons. Okay, and when they and when they broke it all down with their exclusion criteria and their inclusion criteria, they wound up with 23 patients undergoing bone tendon bone, and 14 patients undergoing quad tendon uh, quad tendon uh, autographs. Um, the average age was 18 years old, about 19 years old in these in these subjects, and I said I already mentioned the follow-up was about five years. Um, with that said, we'll get to the results. Um, if we go to table two, we can find we can see that in table two, the only thing between the groups that was different was the time to surgery. I found that very interesting, and I want to get your opinion on that, Doctor Montgomery. Table two, the time to surgery, the time to surgery was. For the bone tendon bone group, um, 1.1 months, and for the quad tendon, I, I mean, I'm sorry, is that months or years? Uh, months or um, let me see. Yes, 1.1 months exactly, and for the quad tendon group, it was four months, 3.7 months. That, that's a pretty big difference. I mean, that was statistically significant at 0.03. Why did you suspect that there was such a uh, uh, a dichotomy, if you will, of of the months between that. I mean, uh, how long do you wait? I know that I know we we usually wait um, in at the Nichols Institute um, until the clinical milestone of minimal knee joint infusion and full extension. Um, we've seen some tragedies when we put a trauma on top of a tra trauma. That's for sure. Um, so, what's your opinion on that, please? Yeah, I have no idea why there would be a difference in that. Um, I, I think you're right, Tim, which is that um, you want to make sure that you have a non-reactive knee, right? So uh, when we see a patient that comes in, uh, and it really, so it's a combination of how much trauma they had, how much they're more likely to be a reactive person as far as their inflammation is concerned, 
uh, and then whether they were immobilized from the beginning. One of the big problems that we see is that people blow out their knee doing a sport. They go to an emergency room or a walk-in clinic, and they, you know, someone comes and does a cursory examination of them and say, well, you got a big swollen knee. You might have hurt something bad. Maybe it's your ACL. Maybe it's this or that. They put him in a knee immobilizer and tell him to follow up with someone. And then by the time they get in to see somebody, they, they, they've been in a knee immobilizer for 10 days or two weeks. And they've been terrified and they've been worried and they haven't been moving it. And now they really have a stiff knee. Whereas you take that same person and just ice them and get early range of motion right from the beginning. And they'd be a lot better in a week than they would be if they were immobilized for a week. So I think early immobilization, I think, gets a lot of people into trouble. Uh, of course, there's some people that just have real reactive knees. As soon as I tell, see people, I say, get out of whatever brace you're in, bend your knee, get started with therapy. Uh, we'll look at you again in two to three weeks. If you have a patient that comes in and, and they can kind of bend their knee to 90 degrees pretty easily uh, without grabbing the table, uh, then they're probably going to get their motion back easily. Uh, for the person who's super stiff, I'll see them again in two weeks and see how they're coming along before I schedule their surgery. But I would say the average time from when I see someone to when they would be ready for surgery would be anywhere from three to four weeks. Um, certainly not four months or no. six weeks. Now, you know, obviously college students tear their ACL and they might wait until a break to get surgery. But to think that all those people had an average of four months, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine why that would be the case. Yes, and that was not uh, mentioned in the discussion, so... But that was one of the things that I was found very curious. I, I have to also say that you have to be aware of the, of the combined ACL MCL tear. Sometimes as a physical therapist, getting that range of motion back, following a combined injury there where you're not going to operate on the MCL, but you got a grade two MCL. It's, it, it can be very difficult regaining range of motion. So have you seen the same thing? Yeah. yeah, when you see that combination, then you know they're going to take longer. Not to mention the fact that to some extent, if they have a real grade two MCL, mm -hmm. you kind of want to know how well that's going to heal before you do the ACL, right? So okay. if you get in there and you you operate on them right away, you don't know whether you should be fixing their MCL or not, like especially these two threes, right? So sometimes we see these high high injury things on MRIs that are, is it a grade two? Is it a grade three? Well, on that, waiting a month to get their range of motion back, but you also, just as importantly, can also see uh, what their MCL stability is like. And most of the time, you don't have to do anything about that, but sometimes you do need to, you know, add an allograft to the MCL to kind of augment it. Mm -hmm. Moving on, um, uh, the results of the article found that when comparing the bone tendon bone to the quad tendon patients, in regards to patient reported outcomes, there is no differences. There is no difference in, in outcomes. Um, they all improved. They increased their Tegner. For those of you, the Tegner activity score is a, is a level of uh, a level of activity or sports, if you will, um, from minimal activity to playing professional sports. And uh, there was no difference there. Some patients did not go back to, uh, to their original level of competition, though. And Table 4 was a descriptive comparison of the reasons for why people didn't go back to soccer, okay? And uh, there was fear avoidance in there. There was ipsilateral re-injury, and there was also um, their interest changed. You know, when you see people that, um, I, 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 I mean, when you see people that rehab in the NFL, you know what, and, they're, and they rehab their Achilles tendon, usually you tear your Achilles tendon at a later age, there's less, there's less years to play NFL football so it's a bad outcome. Well, not necessarily. Their interest that change, or they're not, they're ready to retire. It's not that it's a bad outcome. It's not that this is a bad graph choice. It's just that you know what, they're not playing competitive uh, soccer anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And especially late high school, a lot of people play high school sports and don't play collegiate sports anyways. Large percentage. Uh, and then, of course, the same at the collegiate level. Uh, very few go on to the professional level. So, um, yeah. I, it, listen, when you're 18 years old and you tear your ACL, even if you're not going to play collegiate sports, you probably should have an ACL reconstruction so you can play tennis and pickleball and, you know, 
flag football or frisbee on the beach, you know. So to protect your knee in the long run at that age, very different than the late 30-year-old who can probably just go to the gym and work out on the elliptical machine and still be okay. Mm -hmm. Although this article was very promising showing that uh, there's a lot there's a lot of similarities and the outcomes are just as good in the uh, quad tendon as the patella bone bone patella bone tendon uh, graft choice. Certainly there are some limitations with this study. The study is retrospective in nature, okay? Although they did power this study for, uh, for statistical significance, there is a low sample size, and uh, which caused the caused the sample size to be to be a little bit underpowered. Okay, um, and this was a survey study. There were people in the office, and there may be some um, there may, may be some uh, unwanted bias with that um, using a survey study. Is there anything that you wanted to bring to the audience's attention tonight in terms of in terms of the uh, discussion of this paper, Doctor Montgomery? No, I, I, I think when I look at this, I, I realize it's a relatively small study. And, you know, it's interesting. You started with 200 people or, you know, 100 people and you worked your way down to 14 in one and 20 in the other, something like that. So, so it, it, makes it, it makes it difficult to make giant comparisons with any of these studies. And that's what most of these studies are like, right? They're done by local institutions that have a handful of surgeons. Usually one prefers this. It's, it's rarely someone that's, you know, being completely randomized. It's usually this doctor wants to do quads and this one's going to do patella tendon. So mm -hmm. now let's just compare how all these patients do uh, as opposed to someone truly being randomized to the graft. Uh, it's a harder conversation with patients. Hi, we don't know which is better. So we're going to, you know, reach our hand into a hat and you're going to get that graft or this graft. It's harder to enroll people into that. Um, no, I, I, I think that the study was well done and it's shown what most studies have, which is that these two graphs are essentially relatively equal when it comes to outcomes. Um, I think that you get some of the, some of the other studies which have become meta-analysis uh, and there have been a number of those. So from 2015 to 2022, there have been at least five or six meta-analysis that have looked at dozens and dozens of studies, dozens of studies put together uh, combining BTB and um, quad tendon, or even hamstrings and BTB and quad tendon. And they pretty much all have said the same thing, which is that outcomes-wise, uh, re-injury-wise, Tegner uh, international knee scores are pretty much the same across the board with patella tendon versus quad tendon. And the one thing that many of those studies will say with the summary studies is less anterior knee pain. So same outcomes, same results, less anterior knee pain uh, for most of those studies, uh, which, which are the just big um, meta-analysis studies. Absolutely. Um, and any questions, Rob Shapiro, or questions from the audience, Donna or Rob, uh, in the group, in the chat? One of the thoughts, like the study showed 0% revision rates for the uh, quad tendon. But like 0% what? I didn't hear said, you. Uh, said revision. I'm looking at the study showing 0% revision rate in the quad tendon group and compared to 8.7% in the patella, uh, bone, patella, bone. I wonder why. I what was the absolute number? I saw that too. Do you remember the absolute number? I can look that up right now. Yeah, look there. Well, 0%. Uh, table, table two? Well, eight percent like is probably one, it's, it's probably one patella tendon graft and yeah. none of the yeah. others. So, that's the that's the problem when you have such a small study. Yeah, it's because it's underpowered. Yeah, I mean, you know, zero percent of fourteen people just means that those were fourteen lucky people, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a hundred and there's zero percent, then then that's going to really impress me. But when there's fourteen people and it's zero, you know, I mean, I I would say that I if I look at all of my graphs that we go through every year, and I don't know how many ACLs I do a year, but it's maybe 120 or something like that. I would say I probably have two or three failures every year, regardless of which graft I'm using. Patella tendon, quad tendon, um, you know, it does occur. Uh, when you take someone who's a high intensity athlete and they and then you throw them back to a high intensity sport, particularly if they've had a meniscectomy and other reasons, uh, whether it's their mechanics, whether it's the way they play, 
people get re-injured, just like we probably have a similar number that get the opposite knee that has a ACL reconstruct or an ACL tear. So um, yeah, I mean, when I look at those small numbers, I think that that difference is probably, it's just, as Tim said, it's just underpowered. So um, yeah, I'll look at bigger numbers with larger institutions in the future to kind of make that comparison. But that said, like I said, with the other meta-analysis studies that have looked at hundreds of patients, I'm looking at some that are 200 quad tendons versus 650 uh, BTBs. Uh, there's another one here with something like 514 BTBs versus 580 quad tendons. Those show similar failure rates um, and similar, you know, similar recovery rates and, and return to sports uh, rates with everything. Thank you. Makes sense. Any questions in the chat before we leave? We sign off. And Penny, it's Rob Penarello. Thanks for uh, coming on. I got a couple of questions for you. Since, hey, Rob, uh, how are you? Good. How are you? Are you down in Carolina? Where are you? Or Jacksonville? No no, 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 I'm home. I'm home. Got new coaching staff. So they brought their own people. So I'm home. Ah, gotcha. Well, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, back in New York. Quick four questions for you. One with two parts. On good capability with a quad tendon. Do you, have, do you have a greater incidence of orthogenic inhibition or quad weakness? And if you do, does it take longer to for the quads to come back versus BTB? You were kind of going in and out on that. Yeah, one. you're fading so in and out. You just, Maybe you can type it in the in the group chat. Can you I type it, Rob? Can type it in the group chat. Or, or just yeah, just say it more slowly into your okay. microphone. It's the right. signal. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so since you can take a longer graph with the quad tendon. Do you have a greater incidence of orthogenic inhibition versus BTB? And if that does transpire, does it take longer to resolve versus BTB? So uh, the easy answer is I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I haven't read a study on it. Um, you're talking about the fact that when you take the graph that your, your quad strength just shuts down uh, yes. And is, it, is that what you're talking about? Yes. So, so um, there have been biomechanical studies that have looked at sort of the recovery. So let me just see if I can. Quad tendon versus BTB extensor mechanism, right? So there was a core article that looked at that. There was a article in 2019 that looked at that, the two different graphs. No difference in strength, isokinetic testing, functional test, IKDC between the two groups. So that was a 2019 study with 30 patients. Uh, the other was back in 2008, uh, which looked at them a year later and said that there was no difference. So the one in 2019, which is Hanukkah out of AJSM, um, again, just 30 patients, but did the testing on them and found that there was no difference between the two. And, and I would actually think that that um, it's, it's not a matter of the length of the graft that you're taking. It's a matter of what percentage of the graft you're taking and how that impacts. Um, you know, I, I think the quad tendon is much less invasive on the front of the knee, even though it's high and it's actually in the quad. Uh, because it doesn't cut into the bone, you don't go, get nearly as much bleeding in the knee. At least that's been my experience. Uh, I am certainly very interested, and I want you guys to uh, address, number one, I, the things I want to know from you guys is what like percentages of the ACLs that you're seeing coming through your office are now uh, BTB versus quad tendon, just looking for sweeping generalizations. Um, is it 2%? Is it 20%? Is it, you know, and what are you seeing? Uh, and then two is, what are your thoughts on how patients are doing in the first couple of months after a quad tendon versus a BTB, because you guys are you guys are working with these guys hours every week. We see them once every six weeks. So you you have a you know I'm giving my impression as a surgeon, but you guys are really seeing this, and you're in the ditches. Kenny, has the involvement of the quad tendon changed your decision making on the female athlete? Has the use of the quad tendon changed my decision on the female athlete? Um, 
No, it hasn't. Uh, it's it's become my favorite graft as far as so number one. Uh, I used to use hamstrings more commonly in female athletes than I might in men. Again, it, de it depends on what sport and at what level. So if you're a weekend warrior in your 20s uh, and you're not playing collegiate sports, I would probably do a hamstring on women because it's a nice cosmetic graft. And I, I still will do that from time to time. But if you're a high intensity athlete in your mid 20s, then I'm going to use the quad tendon graft because I think it's just better graft. Um, I don't think that you have the same issues with hyperlaxity. Like if I had a hyperlax female who was 18, 19, I certainly would be concerned about using hamstrings with them because of that hyperlaxity. If their hamstrings are hyperlax and then you use them as a graft, you're more likely to get a looser, stretchier graft, whereas the BTB is a stiffer graft. Um, but I, I would use the quad tendon um, in that situation too. Uh, I don't know. I guess there might be a situation where I'd say I wouldn't use quad over the VTB. Uh, certainly, if I had a patient who had significant disease in their quad tendon um, on their MRI, I might consider not using it, just like we do with the BTBs, right? right. And my last question, um, I was listening to Tom Wickwood give a lecture, and he stated with a female athlete, regardless of the graft you use, um, you're going to have a higher incidence of of injury. And that's because of geometry of the female knee versus the male knee. And he wasn't speaking about slope, but he didn't elaborate on the geometry, what he was referring to. Is there current research that has found something new with regards to the geometry of the female knee? Well, almost every, almost every survey study that looks at um, women uh, versus men ACL injuries has shown a substantially higher incidence of injury in women than men. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that's specifically saying it's just related to the geometry of the knee, whether it's slope or cue angle, um, whether it's muscle mass, whether it's um, the way uh, that some women land uh, and don't protect their knee as well. It's, it's probably multifactorial, including everything from hormonal variation, um, you know, in different times of, of their period. There's all kinds of things that play into the fact that women tend to have uh, more hyperlaxity, less muscle mass, uh, and in some ways um, may have different mechanics because of that when they land and protect that results in a higher risk of injury for women. Uh, that said, the best we can do, I think, in those situations is to rehab people appropriately, um, you know, or or if you're, you know, a believer in doing the preventative uh, ACL prevention programs, then do that to try to teach people, uh, to, particularly women, but but all athletes, um, better mechanics when they're, uh, you know, participating in sports. No, I agree with you. Just the way he presented it, made it, he alluded to, he made it sound like there was recent data about something recently found with geometry. That's why I was asking that. Yeah, it, it may be. I just don't, I'm not sure which study he might be referring to. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Good to see you. You too. All right. That about wraps it up. Dr. Montgomery, thank you for participating tonight. Your uh, your prize will be mailed to you or delivered to you. I'll deliver it. And uh, <laughs> well, you and I need to get together for dinner we sometime soon. So we'll, we'll, we'll we'll, I'll reach out with you offline and we'll set that up. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I really appreciate you uh, coming on tonight, and uh, thank you so so much. Are you See going? It. Are you going to the Jet game this weekend in London, sir? Yeah, we're leaving as soon as I'm done here. I get to to pack my stuff together to get ready to go. We're leaving tomorrow night, and then coming back at like I think, I think we leave after the game. It's like a nine thirty a.m. game, I think. Yeah. So we'll be we'll be home by one in the morning Sunday night. So, yeah, it'll, it'll right. be interesting. it'll Fun. be the third time for me to to a London Jets game. So it should be interesting. And you get to watch an ex Jet quarterback play. That's that's really yeah. fun. Who's who's four and zero and on fire? Um, <laughs> I so, yeah, I, I'm not looking forward to that part, but um, but but hopefully we play well, 
Yeah. Um, Good luck. Hopefully, Sam um, Darnold, who's the nicest guy in the world, uh, and I wish him success, except for this weekend. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a great night. Everybody, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for inviting me.